Good morning, church family. My name is Taylor Gibson, and I have the pleasure of serving on staff in our women's ministry department. I am so glad that you have chosen to join us in church this morning. We're one church in multiple locations, so I wanna welcome those who are worshiping with us in Tyler, Flint, Espanol, and online campuses. Now, if this is your first time visiting, we would love to connect with you. Do us a favor and text the word CONNECT to 903-525-1100, and one of our staff members will reach out to you this week. We wanna hear what's going on in your life. If you have prayer needs or if you need help finding a connect group or finding your place in the church, we're here for you. Now, there's a lot of ways that we are partnering as a church in the community with local mission involvement, and I want you to hear more about that. So why don't we give a listen to Samuel Sadler as he shares about what's going on in our local missions. We're excited to talk about Mentoring Alliance as our local partner highlight for the month of April. Their motto is simple, we mentor kids, it's what we do. We'd like for you to consider being one of those mentors to these boys and girls who don't have the godly presence that you could provide in their life. To learn more about Mentoring Alliance and how you can be a part of this ministry, visit gabc.org forward slash missions and find them under our local partner page. You may have noticed around our church that there's some different signs, promo materials, uh, construction, and just some great fun things happening as we get ready for summer. So here are our kids team and student team to tell you how your family can get involved in our church more. Hey church family, we are so excited that our church is growing and specifically our kids ministry. Well, we have some exciting news for you. We have a new playground that's coming right outside of our Connections Cafe. It's a great place to grab a coffee, to grab breakfast, or to grab lunch. And guess what? You can eat your meal and let your kids play all at the same time. This is going to be for our community. It's gonna be for all campuses and all ages. We're gonna have some comfortable chairs out there if you just wanna meet a friend, or if you want to have lunch outside on picnic tables, we have a lot of great options. There's also a gaga ball pit. So if we have teenagers in the room or young adults, there is going to be something for everyone. We are so excited about that new addition. So thank you church for your generosity. Thank you for giving. Also, we have vacation Bible school coming up. VBS is so much fun. It's gonna be the first full week of June. It's Breaker Rock Beach. We're gonna be talking about God's truth and how it applies to children and their lives. Come and join us. We need you to serve with us. We have a place just for you. And thank you so much for all that you do here. You could go to gabc.org slash VBS to find out more information. We'll see you there. Hey church, I am so excited just to have a moment to share with you a little bit of what's happening in our student ministry. Just a few weeks ago, we had a dodgeball event where we saw uh, close to 300 students come, compete with one another, but most importantly, hear the truth about Jesus. What an exciting night that was in Crosswalk. Uh, I appreciate uh, those of you who moved your cars, who made a little extra space for these students. We are confident that the gospel was proclaimed and we're excited to see the fruit of that evening in the weeks ahead. But just around the corner, right, it's the end of spring, means summer is right here and we are in the midst of camp season. We are getting students excited, sharing with families, sharing with visitors all about our two summer camps. For our high school students, we're going back to the beach. We're gonna be at beach camp in Panama City uh, Beach, Florida, June 16th through the 21st. This week is just a dynamic time for our high school students to connect to one another, but most importantly, to connect with Jesus. It's a powerful, powerful week. We wanna see your high school student there. And if you have a middle school student, we are so excited to announce a new middle school camp this year called Creek Camp. This is gonna happen uh, just a few hours away north of us in Oklahoma at Camp Minnetonka. And we are so pumped to see middle school students connect with one another, but just like our high school camp, connect with Jesus. We know that life transformation happens uh, through the power of Jesus and that can happen at camp. So if you have a middle school student, if you have a high school student, get them registered because spots are filling up fast. We have limited space at both of these facilities. So please don't let your student miss out. And if you're here and you don't have a student, maybe your students are now adults or you have little kids or you're just in the room today, I would love to invite you and pray for us, pray for our students, pray for our community, that high school and middle school students would see the value in coming to camp and make a way to uh, clear their calendar, find the funds, all the things and come to camp. We believe life transformation 
uh, can happen these weeks at camp and we wanna see it happen. Thank you, church. I love being part of a church that loves on and supports our families in such a unique way. Now we're gonna get started with worship soon. If you're online, grab your Bible, grab your coffee, and go ahead and hit that share button so that you can invite your friends and family to join us online this Sunday as well. If you're in the room, go ahead and find your seat and say hello to someone around you as we get ready to worship together this morning. It's so good to see you today. Why don't you stand up, say hello to somebody around you. We're going to begin with praise. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. 
so good to gather with you, church. It's so exciting to see life change every single week here at Green Acres, and we get to celebrate baptisms again this morning. So let's have a seat and take a look. Good morning, church family. We are baptizing in all of our services. It's always an exciting time to follow Jesus and celebrate believers' baptism. First, we have Kylie Williams, who comes for believers' baptism. She came to know Jesus because her aunt shared the faith with her, the hope of Jesus. And I'm here with her dad, Derek. So for all of those that are coming for baptism today, we would love for their family, friends, and ministry leaders to stand in honor of their baptism. Kylie, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes. Well, it gives your dad great privilege, joy, and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. All right, we have Miss Sydney Stewart, and her God story is, is that she's been a believer and she hasn't been obedient to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Baptism always happens after you invite Jesus into your life. I'm here by her connect group leader, Mr. Wade, who's had such an impact on her life. Sydney, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? It gives your connect group leader great privilege and joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. We have Spencer and Bridget Meeks that comes today for Believer's Baptism. They're married and they're a couple, and they said that they need to be bold in their marriage as they pursue Jesus. I love this. Spencer, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes. It gives me great privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk, and you to supply. Now Spencer is gonna have the privilege of baptizing his wife. Bridget, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes. It gives your husband great privilege and joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Congratulations. Let me introduce you to my friend, Mr. Robbie Hobbs. He had a stroke not long ago and wasn't able to go to church. So he started watching Green Acres Baptist Church on television. And through that ministry, he came to know the Lord. Mr. Robbie, is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Yes. It gives me the privilege and honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ. <laughs> Raised to walk in newness of life.
Hey, come on, church. You can do a little better than that. I mean, look at what God is doing. Yes. Man, amen. Hey, you can be seated. Uh, listen, it, it is unbelievable uh, to see what God is doing through you week after week after week. You know, just in the past three weeks, uh, we're celebrating close to 50 baptisms just in the last three weeks. Uh, and that is because of God uh, using you and your faithfulness. And, you know, we can just look around us. We can look what's going on in the world around us. And we know that today in this day and age is a time like no other that people are desperate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are desperate for the good news that is in Christ and through Christ that they could be saved. And I think it's incredible that we as a church family get to be a part of that. I mean, you heard this brother's story just now that um, he couldn't come to church, but because of your faithfulness, because of you making a way for us to broadcast these services literally all over East Texas and beyond, around the world. We have people who uh, email us and, and talk to us from Africa saying, thank you for sharing your services. Listen, you make that a possibility because of the way that you give so generously. I mean, don't, don't sell yourself short on what God is doing through you. Because it takes a church of faithful people committed to the will of God for the gospel to advance. And I'm just grateful that I get to be a, a part of a church as great as this. Aren't you? Aren't you just grateful for this church family? You know, right now, just with the news of yesterday, Another attack in Israel. Now, um, it's, it's not any surprise to us that Iran is involved, but it just weighs heavy. When you see news like this over and over again around the world, listen, it, it should weigh heavy on you as someone who is compassionate. But it shouldn't weigh on you in such a way as if you have no hope. Listen, we know how the story ends. We know who has the final word. And that Jesus who has the final word in the future, in that same word is sustaining all things. And before was that same word that created and brought things into existence. And not one thing is going to happen outside of his power or outside of his authority. And so even when things look so chaotic, we can have peace and hope. But the Bible tells us that we should be compassionate and we should pray for those who are hurting. The Bible even makes it even more clear that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so before we take up today's offering, I just want us to pray together. I want us to be in a spirit of prayer together and maybe start with your own heart and your own life and just ask the Lord today, God, would you speak to me today? Will you just pray with us? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a God who speaks. God, you spoke things into existence. You sustain thing, all things by the power of your word. And Father, it will be you that in your return, you have the final word, that you have the final say for everything that happens in our life, the lives of those around us, the people in Israel, those who are fighting and who are fearful for their lives at this moment. God, I pray that you would comfort them, but God, that you would use it to show that you are the Messiah that was promised 
God, that you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. God, would you use every tragedy that we face in our lives, every suffering, God, to point us to a better faith and a stronger faith, one that is tenacious in your son, Jesus. God, we are asking you, Father, that you would protect those in Israel right now. God, that you would surround them. Father, just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, I pray, God, that your presence would surround them right now. God, I pray for peace. God, I pray for wisdom for the leaders and discernment of of knowing exactly what they need to do next. And God, that you would provide strength and courage when it is needed, boldness when it is needed. But Father, would you also just use this as a reminder that your return is imminent. And God, we are asking, Lord, that in the meantime, as we wait for your arrival, God, that you would make us ambassadors for the name of Jesus. God, that we would live out our faith, that we would be a church family that trusts in you, that loves one another, that strives in unity together. And God, that we would reach those who are desperate for you with your gospel message. Father, help us do that. God, help us to use these offerings that are taken today. God, would you multiply them and would you remind us that it's not our money or it's not just any riches or material things, God, that the advances your kingdom, but God, you use those things. You use our surrender. You use our generosity. You use our lives to advance your kingdom. And so, Father, we ask that you keep doing it and that we would live completely surrendered to you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name.
church, let's just set our heart upon him. That word holy is reserved for him. He is holy. I hope you understand what that means. I've been looking at the Old Testament, how the temple was built, and Solomon, he brought all of this gold, precious stones. It's one of the greatest earthly structures ever built, reserved for God. And when he got done building it and dedicated it to the Lord, he realized this and he said to God, who am I and who is the Lord that he would live among us? For even the highest heavens cannot contain him. See, there's no earthly structure, nothing that is made with human hands that can contain the Lord our God. And yet now, this is the miracle that Jesus says. His temple is now, if you've been forgiven, if you've been redeemed, if you bear his name, it is within us. That's exactly what Solomon said, that this temple was dedicated to bear his name name. And so I just want to bring this reality. May we not come today just kind of complacent or as another ritual or another Sunday, but we are in the presence of a holy God who lives and dwells among us. What a treasure that we have. And just real quick, if you remember what we learned last week about persevering, it's nothing in our own strength, but it's only by the Spirit of God. We're going to sing a song. That's really just a a declaration saying, I will choose to follow you, not because of of some ritual, but because I've seen the treasure that you are and you are worth it. And this is a hard song to sing. I want you to really take in the words because it even says, Lord, I, I, I will embrace suffering just to know you in your suffering. Maybe you're here today and it's a challenge facing you. We can actually have joy through it because of the treasure that Jesus is. So let's set our heart upon him and we'll continue in worship.
what I often do But every song must end And you never do We sing together So I throw in my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a heart Father, we worship you. You are the treasure that we praise today, that you would be the living God to live among us. But we are ready for your very word. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You know, there are names that just seem to matter more than other names. Have you thought about that at all? Have you thought about the significance of one name over another? Let me just give you an example. 
if you were going to show up to Augusta National today and tell them, hey, I am here to play in the final round of the Masters, what do you think they would say to you? They would say, let me show you to your car. I mean, now that's it. However, if your name is Scotty Scheffler, or if your name is Max Homa, or if your name is Bryson DeChambeau, if your name is Jack Nicholas, if your name is Tiger Woods, these names actually have significance at Augusta National. One name seems to just matter over another. Have you ever felt like your name doesn't matter? Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I have no fame. I, nobody knows who I am. And just you, you just feel sometimes insignificant. You know, names in the Bible are pretty important. In fact, the first time we see names is with the Lord in the Garden of Eden, naming the rivers. He tells Adam to name all of the creatures. He changes names. He gives names. He, he gives Adam his name. In fact, he takes the name of Abram and breathes life into it and makes it Abraham. Over and over again, we see significance of names, but what about your name? Does your name matter? You know, so many times we do feel like my name just doesn't matter. We feel distant from God. Maybe we feel like we don't even matter to God. Maybe we feel like God has forgotten us because my name doesn't matter. You know, the Bible teaches something completely different about your name. Did you know that your name actually matters to God? Did you know that your life matters to God? And, and even though you may feel like you are insignificant, that in the kingdom of God, you have a role that the Lord himself has set apart for a very clear purpose. Fame will never mean significance in the kingdom of God. Whether you are known or unknown is not tethered to your significance in the kingdom of God. In fact, what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is that the Lord himself has bestowed gifts for you to be used in the kingdom of, of God. He has decided by his own power and in his own sovereignty that you matter. I think that in a day and age where we put all of our significance and our worth in the way that the world around us values us is detrimental to not only your life but to the kingdom of God. So many times we allow our feelings of how we feel about ourselves or how others view us or the way that we think others view us determine our significance or value. The Lord does something opposite. In fact, we see a character today that has been mentioned a couple times in Hebrews but now is going into further detail that if we were to kind of place the value or the worth of Melchizedek to how often he is cited in Scripture, guess what? He would have no value or significance at all. But what we see is the opposite. What is weird is that the amount of times that he is mentioned is disproportionate to how significant he really is in the kingdom of God. In fact, we see in their relationship between Abraham and Melchizedek that there is something unique that happens here. But there's something unique that you and I can learn about this. We can realize that because of Hebrews chapter 7, you can walk away 
with a confidence that you personally matter to the Lord. Well, how do we get there from Melchizedek to having value in your own life? Because what the writer of Hebrews is doing is building a case that there will be a new priest to come. Based on Genesis chapter 14, based on Psalm chapter 110, that this is pointing to a greater priest, therefore with a greater blessing that you will never understand why you should receive it. You see, based on the blessings of God in your life provides an understanding of your own significance in the kingdom of God. And this is what they tell us in Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to read the entire chapter together. All right, so as you stand up with me, if you're willing and able, I want you to take a deep breath. And understand that this old Georgia boy is going to do his best to read through 28 verses of the Bible. But as we read through it, you're going to see the significance of why we need to just take and bite this off as a whole. It says this in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God most high, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have, have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers and sisters, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men will die uh, receive a tenth, but in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, has paid a tenth through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek? and not according to the order of Aaron. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears. He did it not become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable, for the law perfected nothing. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. None of this has happened without an oath, for other people, uh, others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, for, first for their own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. 
For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you speak to us in ways that only your spirit can. And Father, that we would fall in love even more with your word and your son Jesus and be transformed into his likeness. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, you may be seated once again. I want to remind you the way that the writer is shaping this is to a Jewish audience who have committed to following after Jesus, but through the rise of persecution, they are tempted over and over and over again to turn back to what is most comfortable. What is most comfortable is that they could fly under the radar if they just remain true to their Jewish roots. They can fly under the radar if they don't really contradict any Levitical code or rabbinical thought. If they just kind of go on with what the rabbis say and what they know of the sacrificial system, then no one's going to think anything about this. But following Jesus is different. Why? Because what we saw is that this is the introduction of a new way of life. If there is a new priest, there is a new law. If there is a new law, there is a new way of life. So you got to keep going. As we saw last week, that you have to persevere. Keep moving forward, but in the way that only the writer of Hebrews has been doing, he tells them you have to keep going. Remember that that Jesus is better than Noah. Jesus is better than Abraham. Jesus is better than Moses, and now he comes to the point that only this Jewish audience would really understand to the degree that it is being applied, and he says, and Jesus is even better than Melchizedek. Now, this would have been stunning. You and I, we look at this and we're like, yeah, sure, I I, I would think that Jesus is better than a guy that I've never really heard of. In fact, when you try to study the the priesthood of Melchizedek, you're going to get a lot of varying views about even who this guy is, which is why the writer starts with helping us understand the mystery of God's blessing. Now, all of this is being centered on the way that God would bestow his blessings and give out his blessings freely. And in order for the New Testament saint to understand that, he draws from the illustration of Genesis chapter 14 to help us understand the significance of the name of Melchizedek. And even though it is still wrapped in mystery, it actually provides clarity on why Jesus really is the better priest. He says this, just to unravel this mystery further, when he talks about it in verses 1 and 2, he says he's king of Salem, priest of God most high. Okay, so we know that he is a priest of Jehovah God, not some random liturgy God, but the God. Okay, so he is a priest. He says, of God most high, he met Abraham, blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. But then also, he means king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Now, from the very beginning, this is... Kind of mysterious because no one at this time would hold the same office as king of righteousness, meaning judge, the the rightful ruler over the land, and hold the office of king of peace, which is a way of describing the priesthood of the individual. So here you have two offices combined into one individual, Melchizedek. He says that he is the judge and he is the priest. 
He's the king of righteousness and he's the king of Salem. He's the king of peace. And this makes absolutely no sense. This is unthinkable. It's not just mysterious. It is unthinkable for one individual to hold both offices. But what he is painting a picture of is something that is unique. Because if you think about these two offices, they run parallel, but not hand in hand. I mean, the judge would be intolerable of sin. And yet the priest would be intolerable of rightful judgment. That's the job of the king is to make sure he holds the line of order. It's the job of the the priest to not condone sin, but to help remove the condemnation and the sting of sin. So how do these two offices meet together? Well, this is what the Old Testament has been preparing the the people to understand rightly. That there will be a day that there is a high priest who is the king, who is the priest, who is the prophet, as what was described in Hebrews chapter 1. Now he's giving us somewhat of an illustration of comparison to understand better. Now, this is why Melchizedek is being used, because it's comparing. Some people use this when it says in verse 3 that when he is like the Son of God, um, that he looks in this way, that he is like this, resembling the Son of God. Some people take this when it's talking about having no father, having no mother, no genealogy. Listen, this is saying that, okay, well, this is Jesus in the Old Testament. But I'm going to tell you that I don't think that the Scriptures uh, really provide evidence for that view. Instead, what we see is that the writer is using this comparatively. It would be the way that we could help you understand a president of today if you were to compare them hey, and say, hey, uh, he is like Lincoln in his compassion and leadership. He is like Reagan in his boldness and ability to draw in the American people. Or you could say um, he is like Nixon, as crooked as a snake. Right? There's a way that you can use comparison to help understand a a person today based on historical actual figures. This is what the writer did with Melchizedek. He is honored within the Jewish uh, culture. He's honored among the Jewish people. And if he's using a guy who Abraham, who is the leading patriarch of all uh, of the Jewish people and 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 Abraham gave a tenth of all of his plunder to Melchizedek. How much higher is Melchizedek? How much more significant and honored is he? He's saying this is the way we must understand the priesthood of Christ. Except he's not like Melchizedek in the way that is just here earthly. But rather when he's describing him in verse 3 of no father and mother, he has no end. He's not saying that literally or physically. He's talking about the office that would be taken over by Christ himself. That it would be carried on to the degree that it would never have an end. That the offices that Jesus has and obtains, they have no end to them. And so this mystery of Melchizedek is only to provide further clarity of how God wants to bless you. Because this is what, this is what happens in Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis chapter 14, you see uh, up to this point that Abram and Lot, they have separated. Lot decided he's going to go uh, live around Sodom and Gomorrah. And then we read about these kings who form an alliance in Genesis chapter 14, and they are going against uh, four kings. So you have five kings versus four kings who have formed an alliance, and now they are going against where Lot is. Lot gets captured. All that he has is plundered. Women and children are fleeing, and they're trying to escape. And these five kings who come up against them take 
everything that they have. Someone who survived the raids, he came and told Abram about what was going on. And so what we read is that Abram looked to 318 men of his own household and said, we're going to form another alliance and we're going to retrieve my cousin Lot and retrieve all that he had lost. And so they do, and they are successful. And then he comes back, and this is where Melchizedek comes on the scene. It says uh, somewhere in Genesis chapter 14, somebody can shout it out. Thank you, 18. It says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And it says, he was a priest to God most high. So here we have this, this strange mystery of a character come out. And it obviously was not a Baptist gathering because he brings out bread and wine. And then he starts to celebrate. He says, look at what God has done in your life, Abraham. Because here's what Abraham noticed immediately is that he said, this is what God has done. The God most high, he has secured this victory on our behalf. So let's celebrate not what Abraham has done, not what Melchizedek has done, what God has done to secure this victory. You see, it moves very swiftly from this mystery of God's blessing to the ministry of God's blessing in Abraham's life. And this is where he is moving us. He says this in verse uh, 7. He says, without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. You see, this is contradictory to the way that kings run uh, their things. This is contradictory to the way that a king would reign over his kingdom. Listen, the king is not there to bless you. You are there to bless the king. You come forth and you kiss the ring. You come forth and you offer whatever you have at the feet of the king. But instead, what we are reading is the exact opposite. He says, the inferior is actually blessed by the superior. This is is the model that we see not just in Melchizedek, but this is what is setting the stage to understand the ministry of Jesus Christ, that this is what he would do. That Jesus didn't come so that you could just uh, serve him, but rather what? He came not to be served, but to serve. He came to bestow blessings. In fact, he came to give up his own life so that not just in bread and wine to celebrate what God has done, but in the New Testament, what we see of Jesus is that he didn't offer the bread. He was the bread. He didn't offer the wine. He was the wine. And this was the ministry of Jesus Christ that he came once and for all to secure the greatest blessing that you could ever receive. And that that is a complete saving from your sin. And he said, we have reason to celebrate. We have reason to surrender because the ministry of Christ is that you would have life eternally because this high priest has no end. This high priest, he also has no shortcomings of bestowing his blessings on his people. It is unending. It continues over and over again. And so when we look at this, this one event in Genesis 14, we see how the writer is pointing us to what Jesus would do for you. You see, this is why your name matters. Because the ministry of Jesus was all about your name. Now hear me when I say about that, it's ultimately for the glory of God. But he knew your name before the foundations of the world. He knew that he was going to send his son before the foundations of the world because he knew that you and I, we were going to need a savior. He knew that God knew that you and I were going to choose our own way over the way of God that we would choose ourselves over the way of God. But, but look at what Abraham does. You see, as soon as he understands the blessing of God 
from the Lord to him. The only thing left for Abram to do was just simply to surrender all that he had to the Lord. It says in this that he gave a tenth of everything that he had. And we look at that, and some people use this as a means of of binding you to give to the church. I'm going to tell you that that is not what this illustration is about. This, there's nowhere in uh, Scripture that we see of a New Testament saint that says that you are bound by the law to give 10% of your income to the church. If you can find that, then email me and show me that. Because if we bind ourselves to the law of the Old Testament, then what we are accepting is that we are not... F- we are not living in the freedom of grace of the New Testament. You see, what the law demanded from you, the grace of God promotes freely within you. So when we think about generosity, it has nothing to do with 10%, 12%, 8%, 20%. You know what it has everything to do? with your recognition of God's grace in your own life. This is what happened to Abraham. He recognizes the blessing of God, the grace of God being poured out on him. And then immediately what he does is this, as an act of worship, he says, then all of this is yours, God, because all of this was given to me by you. And so in our understanding of giving, in our understanding of generosity, is that we should wrestle with these things as we recognize the holiness and the grace of God in our lives. Because the greatest gift has been given to us and it is Jesus has saved us. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again and he sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes on your behalf so that your name will always have significance in the throne room of God. This is something that is baffling. Like how could we think about these things and then withhold from the Lord? That's the case that is being built here. How could we think about all that Christ has done, all that God continues to do, and how could we lack generosity? But this is the, this is the area of our lives that you and I are tested most. Generosity has a way of trapping us. It has a way of liberating us, and this is what I mean by that, is because as soon as we realize all that God has done, our grip on the things of this world get looser and looser and looser. And we say, God, I surrender it all to you because you have secured me for all eternity. It is a direct correlation of what God has done in your own life. And you see, and this is the majesty of all of it. Because when we look from the mystery, then we see the ministry, we have to realize the majesty of God's blessing through all of it because this is where he ends it. He, say, he says, listen, this is for all time. Like when we think about the law, it is temporary. So what binds us temporarily is going to keep us temporarily. But what loosens us eternally is the grace of God in our lives. And so we want to hold on to the law of God. We want to embrace the peace that God actually offers once and for all. You see, this is the majesty of God's blessing that he says in verse 25, he says, therefore he is able to save completely, completely those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to intercede for them. You see, this is what is incredible. You see, our name apart from Christ is just as insignificant as you sometimes feel. 
Our name has no weight. And, and in fact, apart from Christ, our, our name means something. It means enemy of God. This is what it means apart from Christ. Your name apart from Christ means insignificant. Your name apart from Christ means weak. Your name apart from Christ means that we are desperate. But in Christ, everything changes. Listen, this is what it says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. It's not going to be on the screen, so this is free of charge. But he says, he who has an ear, he who has an ear, if you have an ear, would you raise your hand, please? All over this room, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. You see, this is what happens when you come to Christ, when you surrender a Christ, the insignificance of your name becomes very significant in the kingdom of God. Not only does he give you gifts, not only does he give you a a, a gift to serve him, but he secures your name for all eternity. He gives you a new name. Now you are branded, you are marked, not as an enemy of God, but as a child of God. Not as impure, but pure. Not wicked, but righteous, only because of the work of Jesus Christ as our high priest. What Melchizedek was longing for, Jesus Christ did once and for all. And for anyone who believes in Jesus Christ, he says, you have a new name written in glory, and now it is the righteousness of Christ that is bestowed on you by the greatest blessing that the Lord would look at you and say, you are mine. Oh, praise be to God that we have a new name in Christ Jesus. And this name, this name is never going to get you in Augusta National. But praise be to God when you stand before him, your new name, he says, welcome child of mine. Are you a child of God? Do you have that new name? Have you trusted in Christ? Does your life reveal that you have trusted in him and that you bear the name of Christ from now on? I pray that today, if you have never been given that name, that today is the name that you say, Jesus, I need a new name in you. Let's pray. God, would you help us Father, when we come short, Father, we, we carry guilt. God, we carry shame at times. Father, we carry anxiety and worry. Father, I pray that today for those who are in Christ Jesus, you would remind them of the name they bear. That it is no longer shame, it is no longer guilt, but now it is cleansed. It is pure. It is righteous. Because, Father, you are the true king of righteousness and the king of peace. And so, Father, we are asking for those who know they have never surrendered to you. God, that today would be the day that you enter into their life, that they surrender to you. And they trust in you for their salvation. And today, you write their name in stone. You write your name in their hearts. And that you today would bind them by your spirit. According to the law of grace. This better covenant. This better way. Because of a better priest named Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we worship you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As you look up, will you stand? And we're going to sing about this great high priest together. And I just want to invite you in to just let this soak in and wrestle with this truth. And for those of you that you know you need to take that next step today, you know that you are not saved, you need to join this church family, lock arms with us for the kingdom of God, or you need to be baptized, whatever that is, I want to talk with you right outside these doors and would love to meet you there. Let's worship together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect.
perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. And I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the good within, upward I look. Last verse, take it. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory. my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Amen. Well, what a great day. Let's go with that thought that he is interceding. He is our Savior. He is our God. You have a great week. We will see you this week.